From the Zimmerman Symphony Center in Canton, Ohio, this is Orchestrating Change. I'm Matthew Jenkins Yaroshevitz, Associate Conductor of the Canton Symphony Orchestra. And I'm Rachel Hegemeyer, Manager of Education and Community Engagement. Welcome to our podcast, and thank you for joining us. This podcast will navigate the issues that exist in the field of classical music and the world at large. We invite you to listen with open ears as our guests share their experience as underrepresented professionals in the music industry. Our guest today is Dr. Ana Abrantes, Director of Education at the Sphinx Organization, one of our nation's leading organizations that is working to develop and support diversity and inclusion in classical music. She holds a doctorate in cello performance from the University of Georgia and held several regional orchestra positions in that state, including principal cello of the Athens Symphony Orchestra. Before joining the Sphinx organization, she held several positions with the Heifetz Institute and is a certified instructor in the Suzuki method. Dr. Anna Abrantes, we have heard so much about the Sphinx organization so far on the podcast, and we are thrilled to have the opportunity to learn more about it from you today. Welcome to Orchestrating Change. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you. As Matthew just mentioned, I think the Sphinx organization has been brought up in almost every episode. Not, not quite every not quite. single, but it's probably half of them. Probably. Yeah. And um, so I, I was just so overjoyed when you responded and we're excited to do this. Um, so, you know, we've, we've mentioned it so many times. We will talk at length about it throughout this entire episode, but we want to first talk a little bit about you. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit about how you were first exposed to classical music and then what led you to decide to pursue it as a career? Yeah, Sphinx is a dream job, so I <laughs> couldn't be happier to be working with them. And I'm so glad that Sphinx has been mentioned in the podcast series. Um, it, it is definitely a wonderful place to be right now. Um, but going back to your question, um, I was introduced to music in a project um, similar to El Sistema in Southeast Brazil. It's called Projeto Guri, which translates to Little Kid Project. And it's an after school music education. At that time, it, in my hometown, it was only string instruments, but then it grew to a full orchestra. Um, and similar to El Sistema, you start as a student and then slowly you become a mentor and instructor. And that happened to me. So I, I, was, I started when I was 12 years old. I was selected in public schools uh, to participate in the launch of the program um, in that area of the state of Sao Paulo. Um, and we started traveling and playing with artists and um, as a beginner to be already exposed to a tour, to me it was revealing and incredible. So at that point, I already knew I wanted to do that for my life. Um, so that door that opened to the music world and what it could be definitely placed a, you know, a heavy weight on my heart and I knew I wanted to do that. And then when I turned 18, I could not be part of the program anymore. So I became an instructor. Um, just a bit before graduating from the project, um, I decided that I needed more because this after school program was amazing, continued to be amazing, but it, the main intent, um, the purpose is not to create musicians. Um, it's an after school program with more social aspects than music education aspects. Um, so I decided that I needed more specialized training. So when I was 16, I started traveling um, to other towns to have lessons because the area in my state and um, the, the area I was born uh, didn't have much access to music education. So I had to travel to the capital or to other towns and I would spend at least four hours inside a bus um, to wow. reach a music instructor and continue my education. So then when I turned 18, I could pass that knowledge that I was gathering 
um, to the new students coming into the project. Mm. So this is how I was um, introduced to music. Before that, I was exposed to concerts because in my hometown in Brazil, there is a huge music festival and students come from all over the world and teachers are renowned artists. So every July, um, the, the festival runs for four weeks. I would just sit by the stage and watch the orchestras and they would go away. And I remember this from you know my early, early memories, just going to the um, concert hall there in, in town and watching the orchestra. So that already exposed me enough to music that I knew I liked it so much. And then when the, the social cultural project came to town, then I had exposure to actually playing the instrument. Mm. Wow. So this is wonderful. You know, we, of course, Rachel and I do a lot of work here at the Canton Symphony with educational programming and in particular programs that the professional orchestra puts on for the young people of our area. And this is it, to, to meet somebody like you who grew up in Canton and was saying the same things would be a dream come true for <laughs> us. It would be a total success. And right. it's what we strive to do all the time. I have to ask, you mentioned taking a bus four hours from your hometown. Did your parents go with you or, or did they just put you on by yourself? And go. It, there are, <laughs> I don't know a lot of parents in this area that would feel comfortable with that. How did your parents deal with this when you were not yet 18? Well, you, you need it, then you do it, right? Um, my parents could not go with me. We had just enough money for one ticket fare. That was me and my cello on my back. Um, and uh, so many times I had to beg the, the driver to let me bring the cello in. Uh. So that was a whole other challenge to, to face. But yeah, um, my parents would just take me to the bus station. I would go to other cities for lessons and music festivals and then come back home. Wow. Absolutely incredible. It's, it's a <laughs> story that is, is going to wow a lot of our audience, honestly. So you've had quite a career. You're a performer. You have a doctorate in cello performance. You've been an educator and administrator. Tell us a little bit about your career path and what led you to your current dream position here with the Sphinx organization. Yeah, so just continue from where I stopped when I was in the project back in Brazil. Um, it was already a great initiative from the government of Sao Paulo, but many times I faced times when I didn't have strings in an instrument or something was broken or, you know, and repair was not accessible. So I had to always fight for more instruments, for donations, for help, you know, connections. So that part of my job started early. And then I started going to music festivals in Brazil, making connections. When I finally got to one that I met the connection to the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and there was an audition there and um, I didn't have steady teachers. As I mentioned, I was traveling all over trying to find a teacher. So my technique was kind of shaky and I, I didn't believe in myself that I would be able to do such a thing, but I took the audition with all my passion and I was offered a full scholarship to come to Mississippi wow. for undergrad. And as soon as I got here, my work fighting for this and that continued. I became a student ambassador for international students and I was uh, trying to find furniture, apartments to rent, health insurance, all those things for people that were arriving because I didn't feel I had that help when I arrived. So I continued that work there and um, the fact that the orchestra there provided so many opportunities for Latin American students um, made me fight even harder because I felt represented there. So that work continued. Then I moved on to grad school. Um, I was fortunate to study at the University of Georgia. Um, wonderful support there. Facilities and, and faculty are amazing. So I feel that I didn't have to fight as much because we had a lot provided there. Um, I went through master's and doctorate degrees um, with full assistantship at, at the University of Georgia. Then I had this wonderful opportunity to work um, as a summer staff at the uh, Heifetz International Music Institute. And I was an artistic coordinator. 
for one summer. And then I was offered the position of operations manager and HIFET SPEG director. HIFET SPEG is a smaller program inside the HIFET Institute uh, for students eight to 13 years old. So that was definitely my passion because I am a music educator. So directing that program was a privilege and I'm so grateful for everything I learned there. And um, working as an administrator, just finished a performance degree was hard mentally. Mm -hmm. um, I had a career conflict inside my mind because um, my own cello teacher was saying, you shouldn't be behind a computer. You shouldn't be wasting your time in these things that you're doing here. Um, as a TA, I had other duties. So he said, you should be just performing and not wasting your time on these things. And when I got to the Heifetz Institute, I wasn't playing anymore. I was basically providing opportunities for other people to play. And in my instruction, instructor's mind, that wasn't enough for me, mm -hmm. but I was happy. However, in my mind, that voice of him saying, this is not what you should be doing, you should be playing, was a, definitely a conflict in my mind. So I came to the Sphinx Connect, a uh, huge conference that happens early February or end of January every year. Um, I already knew about the Sphinx organization from years earlier because um, going back to University of Southern Mississippi, many of my friends from that university got to the competition, became Sphinx artists. So I, I was already familiar with the organization, but the first time I came to the conference, was when I realized that I had finally found my voice and my mission. Mm -hmm. I never felt so welcomed as I did when I came to the Sphinx Connect in 2018. Um, seeing all the leaders around me, all the colleagues um, with the same background doing amazing work, um, gave me peace, the peace that I needed, that I was enabling other people to be on stage. And that work <clears throat> is also valuable. So um, when I saw the position open last year for the uh, director of education, I had to apply and I was fortunate and privileged to be um, hired as the director of education. So yes, it is a dream job and I couldn't be more fortunate to be here. Wow. Absolutely. And but, I didn't realize you hadn't been there particularly long. So mm -hmm. let me say is again, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank I, you. I think, you know, that story that you say, I think um, in the classical music world, a lot, especially if you go to conservatory, if you go to music school specifically for performance, there's a lot of stigma that if you end up not doing performance, that you're not a real musician or you have failed in some way. And I, I also have a performance degree and and I work in arts administration doing education. Um, but I I went into it with that mindset. I actually got a dual degree. I got bassoon performance and arts administration. So it's, but I still have that, that, that moment of, I don't play bassoon as much as I used to. I don't play um, nearly as much as I did when I was at the conservatory. So uh, it's really wonderful to hear you say that and to give some validation for those arts administrators out there who started as performance majors and, and, and realized that we need more arts administrators who understand the passion and the value of performance because they will be able to speak to and program and create the work that needs to happen. So, you know, I think it's wonderful that that you do that. And I'm so happy that you're in this role now because I can tell how much passion you have for it. And that just makes me very, very happy. Um, but, you know, we've, we've mentioned here now, you know, you grew up in Brazil um, and then you studied music here in America at the collegiate level. So, can you kind of give us a glimpse at the difference between our education systems kind of in America versus Brazil and, and how your mind kind of dealt with the change? Sure. Just adding for to what you just said, I don't regret a single bit getting undergrad, master's and doctorate in performance mm -hmm. and also getting opportunities to play in orchestras. Like uh, you mentioned, I was principal at the Athens Symphony. I also performed with the Macon Symphony, Georgia, Columbus Symphony, and others in Mississippi. All of that made the administrator that I am today. 
and the educator. So if mm -hmm. I am to teach somebody, I know what the paths are up to the doctorate degree. So I don't regret that a single bit. And I think it all contributed to who I am. Mm -hmm. If I do have a regret, it would be not adding arts administrator as an education piece on my resume, but that doesn't mean that I didn't get the um, knowledge from doing it. Yeah. So just yeah. adding a little bit to what you just said. For sure. Um, and then to your question about Brazil music education, it really depends on where you go. Um, Brazil is a continental country, so it's huge and you have everything that you can imagine. So depending on where you go, the education system can be similar to here. It can be better, it can be worse. It depends on the school, if it's private, public, or who is teaching. Um, so it's hard to, to compare. Um, it depends on the area. I would say that overall, there are laws that um, state that schools should offer music education everywhere in Brazil. We are far from achieving that. Um, so I feel that schools here in the United States have it more established with music education, band, orchestra, curriculums. So that's more established here, but we are on the way of getting that. Um, for the university and collegiate system, we do have free university um, for all in Brazil, but then it comes to who gets in um, because the, the exams for you to be admitted are so hard mm. and it involves a lot of subjects that usually students who go to private school for high school will have better chances to be admitted into the public university. So then it's a different um, level of difficulties, not only um, access to free education, but also your knowledge before that and, and then it's a level, you know, it's, it gets political from there on. So <laughs> yeah, that is a different, you do have access to free education, but if you're going to get in, that's a different story. And it's um, fascinating because here we have private universities, uh, sort of the elite universities of the United States are private universities that people go into a lot of debt to get degrees from. And it sounds like in Brazil, possibly you get you go into a lot of debt in high school to go to a private school, so then you can get into the free public university. Yeah. It's a it's a totally yeah. different interesting paradigm yeah. than what we have here. So we need some adjustments both in both places here and there um, to meet halfway. Um, I was fortunate enough to not have a single dollar in debt, and I got all my degrees here in the United States as an international student. So. There is a way um, to do things. <laughs> wow, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. So you mentioned your education. You went to Southern Mississippi. You went to the University of Georgia. You talked about as well that you felt you needed to be an ambassador for other international students because this was not something that you, you did not have the guidance that you felt you needed and you wanted to give this to others. Tell us, what was it like coming in to a place like the University of Southern Mississippi as an international student whose first language was something other than English. Yeah, and in fact, when I came, I spoke nothing, a word of English. I didn't speak the language wow. at all. So, <laughs> wow, that's impressive. You learned as an adult, I, I'm, wow. I'm blown away. You speak absolutely <laughs> beautiful English. Wow, I feel, I feel not as good about myself. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, owe, I owe my life to a man um, in Mississippi. His name is Jay Dean. And he was the orchestra director at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and about 20 years ago, he was trying to recruit students to come and study at Mississippi. Um, but students were just not coming. Um, there are so many schools in the United States that students were just going to other schools and not USM. So he created this fundraising initiative that he called Five and Five. So in five years, he raised $5 million. Wow. And with the interest of that money and the investments, he could generate scholarships to bring students to U USM. And students were still not coming. Um, so he went abroad, especially in Latin America, um, to recruit students. And this is how I came. So he came to a music festival in Southeast Brazil. And I played and I was offered full scholarship. Um, so he had partners in Mississippi, doctors who would give scholarships and also the fundraising um, initiative that he 
ran and with that money he was bringing students from all over South America. And in fact, as the opposite of what we see in orchestras in the country, the representation of um, Black and Latin next musicians in the University of Georgia, uh, University of Southern Mississippi Symphony Orchestra was more than 80%. So wow. thinking I'm about blown away. I learned both English and Spanish together because all my colleagues in the University of Southern Mississippi or Orchestra were from Brazil or Venezuela or Cuba or Colombia or Central America, or Honduras. There were a lot of people from Honduras. So I learned both English and Spanish together. Um, and seeing what all he was doing there really inspired me to be grateful, first of all, and give back and also help other people because I came without speaking the language. It was hard to learn. <clears throat> they have a wonderful um, English language institute in the University of Southern Miss. And I learned in six months the necessary uh, amount to pass the TOEFL test. So they are intensive and they're wonderful. So when I came, instead of starting undergrad right away, the orchestra would pay my English studies for six months. So I could learn the language and then start undergrad um, with the scholarship that they offered. Um, so it was part of the package and I, I have those six months to learn, so I had to do it. Um, and then as a bonus with my um, colleagues in the orchestra and my um, roommates, I also learned Spanish. Wow, that's amazing. So we have talked so much about the lack of representation of people of color in orchestras in this country and to imagine the orchestra at southern mississippi 80 percent minority is just it blows my mind honestly and i'm wondering if you could tell us what are some of the professional orchestras that your colleagues an undergrad are now playing with? Um, I know people in the Houston Symphony, um, New Jersey Symphony, um, Chicago Civic had people from USM, um, Dallas Symphony, places in Florida that I will not be able to name, but <laughs> yeah, all over the country. And wow. some big, big time orchestras yeah. here, Houston, Dallas. And this is, this is amazing. This is really incredible. That, I mean, when you said 80%, I mean, the, that is wonderful. This is kind of going a little bit. How do you, I mean, that must've been so validating to be in an orchestra that was full of people that you could share experience with but at the same time was very multicultural. It had, because as you mentioned, people from all over Latin America. Um, so what was that experience like? And how do you think that informed you as a, as a musician and performer? I, the one thing I remember the most is the energy and the dedication that we all had. We had extra sectionals. We had extra rehearsals until you know, we were done. We didn't think about time. We would just meet and rehearse and prepare. And one of the things that would drive us to have that energy and, and preparedness um, was once a year, Jay Dean would bring a huge name to play with us. So the year before I, I, arri before I arrived was Yo-Yo Ma. So I missed that one. Oh. <laughs> then we got Joshua Bell, um, Nigel Salerno, Renee Fleming, and you name it. And so every year, a huge star would come to perform as a soloist with U USM Orchestra. And a week before, we would play the same concert repertoire with, with a faculty from the USM um, School of Music or somebody from the area would come and perform. So the orchestra would be prepared. We did a lot of, you know, test concerts to be ready for that level um, of artistry. And so I remember that as a very special thing every year that we would prepare for that. And the tours and, and the opportunities around Hattiesburg area there were also very um, inspiring. Wow. wow. Amazing. At Southern Mississippi, with the orchestra, the demographics of the orchestra being what they were, did you play a lot of music by black and Latino composers as a result? We did. In fact, there, there were many concerts um, with 
living composers. Um, one of that I have a memory is from Artur Barbosa. He's a Brazilian composer. He came, we played his violin concerto. Um, we also played um, William Grant still a full concert many times. Um, there is um, Ivan Ilmar Gavilan, the violinist. His dad is a composer and he came as a soloist to play with the orchestra. And we played his dad's violin concerto as well. Um, and, and it was kind of hard at that time because Cuba and US relations were not as great as it became later. So traveling was not easy, but still we got the composer to travel from Cuba and be there um, to hear the, the concerto uh, performed by the um, university orchestra and, and his son. So that was a special moment as well. And there are many other opportunities that we could include um, composers that were always underrepresented into the um, season series. That doesn't mean that we excluded Beethoven, Brahms, and the greats. We still had all that, but we also featured many of the underrepresented composers. Yeah. And would you say this was something that the orchestra, that it, this really meant a lot to the orchestra to play this music? Definitely. As a, as a Brazilian, when I played Artur Barbosa's music, that was special. When we played Villa Lobos was very mm -hmm. special because I felt represented. And, and I felt that we have other geniuses that are as great as, you know, Beethoven, Brahms, Sansans, Dvorak. And they are not played and they are equally genius. So hearing that music and performing that music was definitely part of the great memories I have from USM. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, you know, America is a country of immigrants. <laughs> it is. Everyone here is an immigrant in some form or another. Maybe you have to go back a few generations, but... For anyone who's seen the musical <laughs> Hamilton, immigrants, we, we get, get the, the job, job done. done. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so you are an immigrant of this country and you have chosen to stay here and work here and, and are doing amazing work here. What is it like to be an immigrant in America right now? Um, from my early days when I just arrived, I feel that I always had to give 110%. Mm. Um, because I was an equal, um, but also because I was extremely grateful, as I mentioned. I wanted to give back, so I worked the extra percentage, you know, over 100. So I would be seeing as an immigrant and also I would give back all the opportunities that I was given. Mm. Um, as a person, I had to break my own barriers. I was a very shy girl when I first arrived and not speaking the language had to, you know, I had to break barriers right there, you know, to order any food in English or to speak with anybody other than in orchestra, just understanding the measure number that we would start on, you know? So basic things, every day I was breaking barriers, every single day. Um, so that gave me a lot of lessons on growth and resilience um, that really transformed me. And, you know, that turns into my professional life as well. Um, I had to learn to never turn down an opportunity as small as it could seem at the time. Um, at this, you know, the smallest gig would put me in connection with somebody who would bring me to this other thing. And, and so the network would just build. So these are the lessons that I learned both as an immigrant and the personal level and professional level, just connect and be exposed because as one of the phrases that I love, I heard at the documentary by Michelle Obama, her documentary Becoming, one of the main phrases that you know got to me and I, I really identified with that phrase was that we cannot wait for the world to be equal in order to be seen mm. and I feel that I always had to do that so you cannot waste your time just lamenting the world does not equal just go in and do things and and show that your work can be as good or better than any other work wow so Moving on to what you're doing today. You're with the Sphinx Organization as Director of Education. We've heard a lot about the Sphinx Organization about, so far on the podcast, but 
for anyone who's just jumping into the podcast here as their first episode, give us a brief overview of some of the work that the Sphinx organization does. Sure. Arnold Working is the founder and he's a visionary. In 1997, he was a student at the University of Michigan and he felt that he was the only black violinist ever to play. And he, he felt that other people were out there, but they were just hidden, they were hadn't been discovered. So from a simple but impactful idea of creating a competition to showcase those musicians, the Sphinx organization became a reality. Um, so he created this competition for only Black and Latinx musicians because back in 1997, the percentage of people of color in orchestras were 2.5%, um, um, more or less. And when you analyze the percentage of those minorities in, in the community, it, that doesn't represent the amount of people we get. So he decided to showcase those people of color so they could get a chance in the orchestra and classical music world. So that was the initial idea. And with a lot of support from institutions and people who were buying the idea and the energy and the investment that Aaron had uh, in the early years of Sphinx, the organization became what it is today. Um, I like the, the name Sphinx because of the mythical creature that represents power, wisdom, persistence. And I feel that you find those things in all the artists that become part of the Sphinx organization. Um, there are four main areas education and access that I'm the director of, and then artist development. So you open the doors with education, right? And then the, the musicians have the artist development portfolio to continue working. And then we have the professional level performing uh, artists and then arts leadership that, you know, helps everything come together. Mm -hmm. So these four main areas um, may make Sphinx what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I love I was you know perusing the website. I love everything uh, uh, about how it it's set up in a way that its goal is to create the pipeline. Right, the goal is to create from the very beginning to the very end developed um, artists and understanders of the world of classical music, and um, I, it's something that I. I feel more organizations should be striving to do. And it's something that we have talked about quite a bit on this podcast is we, the pipeline, the pipeline, the pipe, we just, it keeps getting brought up. It keeps getting brought up. And there are organizations obviously like you all that are doing it. Um, and so the goal of our podcast is to create conversation around all of the things like list on your website, you know, developing, supporting diversity, inclusion, and classical music at every level administration, education, performance, all of these levels. So those four areas that you mentioned, the education and access, artist development, performing artists, and arts leadership. How do you see those four areas in their current state just around America working together to move into the future? So kind of going outside of Sphinx, how can these four areas work together better to move us forward in the future? Yeah, so similar to the project where I was introduced to music education, um, under the education portfolio, we have the Overture program that opened the door um, of music education to um, kids here in Detroit and Flint. Then the next step, on, still under the education portfolio, we have the Sphinx Performance Academy that is a more intensive chamber music um, summer program for more advanced students aged 11 to 17. So this is the next step that we hope that our kids from the Overture program can achieve. And then from there, they can be part of the competition and then become artists of the Sphinx organization and then be in the professional level groups that we have. Um, and the administrative level um, with the other portfolio about arts leadership ties it all together because we are um, teaching and training leaders that go all over the country that can take our idea from Michigan and spread it across the US. Mm -hmm. So our program now only happens in, in Flint and Detroit for the education portfolio. But my goal as an educator is to continue building on the curriculum and perhaps having it um, part of you know, an, 
a national endeavor. Right. Um, so that's my, my long time ago. But already we are doing the groundwork and we are teaching leaders to spread the word about this groundwork that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we are already spreading the work in, in, across the country in the administrative level, but hopefully the education portfolio can also grow in other states. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I because it is one of those things that if, unless the people at the top, unless the people who are the, the arts leaders are, unless they're dedicated to this work, it's mm -hmm. the other three levels below it's almost impossible to get that going because you just have to have people who are running organizations, leading in organizations, understand the importance of what this work is before a community program can get started in, a, in a, an organization. So, yeah, I think that's really wonderful that you do that training. I think it's it's so important. It's really important. Tell us, actually, tell us a little bit about what somebody who is in the Sphinx training program for arts administration. What does the program look like? So under, under arts uh, leadership, we have the Sphinx Connect. Um, mm -hmm. There's this huge conference that administrators all come together and share their knowledge. We have panels, we have discussions, masterclasses. You know, it's a three day, really busy conference that you learn a lot and you exchange a lot. And you get inspired and you, you, from there you do the work for the entire year and then you back for more. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it is the Sphinx lead. And for that you apply and you're selected and you go through an intensive training. Um, and, and that really makes the, the leaders that we need to just spread the word and, and keep communicating and bringing diversity, equity and inclusion to all corners of the United States yeah. um, and abroad. Mm -hmm. And Sphinx lead in normal times, would this be an in-person program that people would come to every periodically to learn in person and with each other? Yes. And our recent partner now is the Colburn School in LA. So mm -hmm. um, yes, we meet in person for this past year. It has been all virtual, but it's still very impactful. Right, right. Absolutely. I, it's, there's a lot of really wonderful programs and I, I think everyone could learn from each other. I was fortunate to be a part of the League of American Orchestra's Essentials of Orchestra Management program, which also happens in LA. And it was a two week, crazy, crazy learning experience in LA that I got to be a part of. And that was wonderful. And we're at the symphony here um, at the time that this is being recorded has not happened yet, but when this is being released will be happening. Um, we're going to be doing a leadership program for students in this area, specifically students from diverse backgrounds who want to pursue careers in music. So it's going to be my pilot year of doing something like this. So I definitely will probably be emailing you all and your colleagues a little bit more, maybe getting some suggestions and uh fingers crossed that it's going well right now currently as people are listening so absolutely so the current moment in the world in the country and in the orchestral world the four areas that sphinx focuses on of those four is there one that you feel right now needs more attention from orchestras across america as well as from sphinx I feel that it's been a long journey for Sphinx and for um, diversity and inclusion. Um, for Sphinx, it has been 24 years. And finally, we are seeing lots of articles, scholarly articles, and we're seeing, you know, philanthropic journals paying attention to this issue. And it's great to see it reaching that level. Um, but as an educator and as um, director of the education portfolio here at Sphinx, I feel that we, the strongest thing we can do is continue working on the ground level, um, bringing more students to music and showing them um, a different life perspective. Um, just like I had a different life perspective showed to me when I was 12, that really can impact a lot of lives. So for me as director of education, I would say that that's the most important work that can be done, not only at Sphinx, but orchestras across the country. Um, devoting a lot of attention to the educational programs, youth symphonies, because that will not only change the perspective of each child, but also diversify your audience, um, bring more people to your concert halls. So it's a win-win. Everybody wins with, you know, when you pay more attention to the education. 
and um, you know, just sharing and communicating and showing these kids what can be done. You know, I, I don't feel that I'm special. There are tons of people like me out there that needs to be discovered. But when I look back, um, when I was 12, you know, with no life perspective in a small town in Southeast Brazil, and now leading an education program at Sphinx, it feels unreal. It feels like impossible, but it's not. It's, you just need to get the groundwork done and communicate and show and, and work with the kids because you never know how many Barack Obamas you will find, how many um, Jesse Montgomery's composers you will find, how many, and the list goes, goes on. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we talk so much about at Youth Symphony, our goal is to create educated consumers of the arts. We don't expect our Youth Symphony kids to all become professional musicians, but we want them to grow up to be patrons of whatever orchestra they, uh, wh wherever they live, their city's orchestra. And to say they, they get the season brochure, look at that. I played that piece when I was young. Let's, let's take the family and go see it. Mm -hmm. If we can accomplish that with our youth orchestra, that's, that's a win for us, a huge win. And one of the things we are trying to, we are hoping to do is diversify our youth orchestra. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, it's almost exclusively white uh, in this area. They're really not even a lot of Asian students. There are a few and uh, very, very, very few. It's, it's, a, it's a rare year when we get an African-American student. Mm -hmm. So we're really working to, to find ways to broaden our appeal to some communities that we haven't served right. with our youth symphony. And that kind of leads us into this next question is, you know, education and access is, is the portfolio that you kind of serve. So this access portion, what are some, you know, efforts that you're working on to increase the amount of, of live classical music exposure that has in communities that haven't been able to have that in the past or just haven't had access to it? whether that be price, location, or just interest? What what are some ways that you've been trying to increase access? Um, this year, because of the pandemic, we, we were hit hard on that area. Um, mm -hmm. It's hard to give access to music to beginners when you're only over Zoom. Right. We are still doing some work with general music classes online and for the students who were already part of the program doing violin lessons online. But that has impacted our program heavily, um, but in a normal period, you know, I, I, ha I haven't been to the Sphinx during a normal time yet because I started in the middle of the pandemic, right. but my hopes is to return to um, the time when we are active in the schools, um, presenting concerts, um, bringing artists from the Detroit Symphony or from the Sphinx Virtuoso program to play for, to the kids. Mm -hmm. So they can hear the instrument and hear how much fun it is and just look forward to after school programs, learning to play music and just having them perform several recitals and, and, and show uh, their parents what they're doing and also showcase them on social media just to um, create the interest and, and nur nurture um, that interest and keep it for, for years during the elementary school. Um, Overture is only working in elementary schools for now, but hopefully after that, they will continue music education um, in a Institute of Music, like in Flint, we have Flint Institute of Music. So we hope that the kids that are now part of Overture can transition to a more specialized training after they, they are part of our program. So access is giving in a way that we present music to them. If they are interested, we give them the instrument um, we have uh, our sponsors that help us get the instruments. And if they complete the program with great attendance, they can keep the instrument so they can continue their education with the violin. They don't need to return it. So this is how we give access at the ground level. Wow. And then, as I mentioned, we want them to continue education in Detroit and Flint um, with more speciali specialized training, and then hopefully get to the uh, spa, um, Sphinx Performance Academy. Mm -hmm. um, a little later on. And one thing you, you mentioned is you said students get exposed, they see how fun it is, they tell their parents. And I think being able to get parents to understand the value, why should my child be spending all this time after school? Why should my child be doing this? 
in areas where there aren't free things, why should I spend money on lessons? I think that's a really key part as well as bringing families aboard. And how have you done that a little bit to, to bring the families along with the students on this journey? Um, this year, as I mentioned, has been a little tough. So right. communication has been mainly um, over emails. Mm -hmm. um, so attendance has been a problem because parents are not fully aware of what is going on. And also because kids are uh, virtually spent. They yeah. go to school all online. And when it comes to after school programs, they are overwhelmed. They cannot do anything anymore. But uh, my hopes when we go back is to use my knowledge from the Suzuki background that I have that it is a triangle. We have the teacher, we have the child, but we have the parent. And if the parent is not there, it's not gonna work. Something is missing. And the interest and the um, work that is um, invested in, in the music learning needs to come from home. You know, it has to have support from parents and then the school uh, with our teachers and then finally the student being committed. Um, but it all ties together with the the perfect triangle there. So yeah. my hopes is when we go back in person to just get the parents involved as much as possible and that will create the interest. And just a, a reference as my own life again, back when I was young, the, the fact that we would perform and we would get exposure to concerts was already an attractive enough for me to continue working. And then a couple of years later, I would start getting my first gigs and being independent and getting a little money from here and there was so attractive. And if we share that timeline with students and parents, I think they can stick to music and, and keep learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a, a lot about the Sphinx Overture program already, but tell us a little bit about the program's history. Was it, did it come to, from 1997? Has the Overture program been a part of Sphinx all along, as well as what is the schedule like for a young man or woman just starting out uh, in this program? What is their schedule like? Sure, uh, Overture took, some, took about 10 years to be implemented. Um, the idea was there from the beginning that we have to give access to students. So they tried um, different programs, one of them called Sphinx Prep. Um, they had, a, um, I, I think it was a library in Detroit that would offer lessons, but students were just not coming in because of tr uh, transportation issues. You know, we were giving access, but kids still didn't have access to get to the place. Mm -hmm. So um, thankful to the Skillman Foundation back in 2007, Overture was developed in the schools. So it started with just one or two schools in Detroit and one school in Flint, um, and then Again, thankful to Mott uh, Foundation and CS Mott Foundation, uh, Ruth Mott Foundation and CS Mott Foundation in Flint. Both of them help, uh, helped us bring the program to all elementary schools in Flint. So now we attend nine schools um, in Flint and we hope to keep growing. Uh, we just have a new partner there, Sylvester Broom, Broom Empowerment Village. We're offering after school um, work there too with music. Um, so uh, back then it became clear that bringing music instructions to schools would allow us to touch more lives. And, um, but then this, the transportation was an issue. So going to the kids was the way to go. Mm -hmm. So if you bring music to the schools, they are already there, you know, access is much easier that way. Okay. So this is what we continue to do, bringing not only lessons, teachers, the violins, but also extra concerts, performances, and the list goes on. About the schedule, um, we offer two group classes a week and one private lesson. So depending on the school, it will change Tuesday or Thursdays or Monday or Wednesdays, it depends, but two group classes, an hour each, and then a 30 minute lesson. Um, this is what we offer um, in a normal time. Uh, yeah. During pandemic, we're doing private lessons online. Some of the schools are able to do group. They cannot play together because of Zoom limits, yeah. but um, we can still meet every week and make sure that we are keeping and nurturing the community um, sense of uh, or the overture program. Mm -hmm. wow. Is this primarily string instruction or is it all instrument instruction? For now, only violin. Violin, okay. 
Um, but um, one of my goals is to increase uh, that to other instruments as well. But for now, only violin. Well, it's it's easier when, when the children are smaller <laughs> to give them a smaller instrument because I do instrument petting zoo sometimes and it's really funny to watch the young children even try to hold um, a three quarter size violin. It's, it's too big for them. So it's, 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 uh, very, it, um, that, I think that's wonderful even to give them something. Um, one question I, I have is a lot of times I, I get told this a lot. And I think a lot of people who work in education get told this, that if something is offered completely free, that the buy-in or the incentive, which I don't necessarily like that word, but the incentive for people to participate and stay dedicated to the program goes down because there's no financial motivation. Um, I've never really liked that, but I've, it's been mentioned and told to me so many times. Do you find that in your work before Sphinx and now, if that is necessarily true, or is that completely a falsehood that we just somehow just have decided is true? I try to believe it's false. Um, going back to my own experience, that was the one thing that was given to me. I didn't have opportunity to do soccer and, and you know foreign languages and this and that and then music. That would be something extra that I wouldn't pay attention to. I was only offered music. That was the one thing that I could focus and grab like it was the, the last opportunity of my life. So there's that. Depending on where you offer it, the background of who is being offered that to will, will tell you a lot if they will be dedicated or not. Um, so it depends on privilege and, and depends on what you have. Mm. But then you may find somebody who has access to everything and still dedicate their life to music and to the free stuff they get because they're grateful. So it depends on the individual, I would say. And I'm, I'm a hopeful person, so I, I try to believe that that is false. And, and the work that you do will impact that. So if you're doing excellent work and you're investing yourself and if you're giving a lot of yourself, the student will feel that and it will it will be reciprocated they, you know they will give you back mm -hmm. yeah i think that kind of that leads into you know the community impact and i my you know my next thing is how has this overture impacted the community how has this program impacted the schools the teachers their parents um and i you know what you just said about if you dedicate yourself then it's much easier for students to dedicate themselves so do you mind speaking a little bit about the community impact of this program and, and how it's impacted people sure um at the first level with the students we are impacting their lives giving them purpose um, and sharing a new perspective right something that they can find their path or if if they don't go through the music path which is not the intent by the way of overture just like the project that i where i was introduced to music the main purpose was not become a musician but just give you something to do after school that will drive you toward a new career um, and i have friends from that project that became lawyers engineers and and they had a great experience at the program that opened doors to other things that they did. So there is that impact in the community. We are opening the doors to music education, but with our example and with other opportunities that they can see, you will give them life perspective, whatever way they go. Um, the next level of impact in the community is our teachers. So most of our violin teachers are um, students in the University of Michigan or the State Michigan University or professional musicians in the Detroit area. And they also need our support. So this is a way that we can help them and they help us uh, back. So we have the budget to hire these wonderful teachers so they can share their experience with the young students and the, the wheel keeps running. And hopefully one day these kids, if they do become a musician, they will use what they learned here to teach others and, and on and on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know you've only been at Sphinx for a limited amount of time, but the program, the Overture program has been going on long enough that its earliest participants are now young adults. Do you know what some of the initial classes of the Overture program are doing these days with their lives? Have any of them gone into the profession or what other interesting things? How has this positive, positively affected these this first couple of classes of people as they become young adults uh, this is an ongoing research that i'm doing since i'm new to the institution i don't have a lot of contact with alums 
but I am gathering that information. And from my early research, I can tell that some of the kids, especially in Flint, have gone to the Flint Institute of Music. They have been part of the youth symphony there. Um, they have applied to the Sphinx Performance Academy. And there is where my research stopped. So <laughs> I will continue looking for names from the early years in 2007 all the way to today and keeping track of where they are and the impact that you know, happened after they were part of Sphinx. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's so exciting to know that the program has been going on long enough that we've now seen basically a whole generation uh, go through it. Seven years old, eight years old, and now they're, they're 20, 21 here. And so it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, so let's move on a little bit up the up the level here from the Overture program to the Performance Academy. You talked a little bit about that, but uh, what are some ways that the Performance Academy differs from the Overture program? I know it, uh, other than catering to older students and everything that comes with that, but tell us a little bit about the Performance Academy. So the Performance Academy started also around 2006 eight or nine around that area, um, uh, around that time. Um, and it's a more advanced uh, summer program for string players. And for that, um, a student needs to be able to play a three octave scale, a movement of a concerto or sonata, and then Bach. So <laughs> that's, that's not for overture kids. That's more advanced summer yep. programs. It's getting more and more competitive by the year. I've been watching uh, applications from previous years and then this year and I can tell you that the level keeps growing um, and also the partnerships that we get keeps getting more and more amazing it started with one site and then it became two uh, two week programs and now we have three um, in the past the partnership was with Roosevelt University then Oberlin College and now we have Curtis CIM and Juilliard so Three of the top schools of music that we can get in the country are our partners for those programs and we can not only showcase our own artists, our Sphinx artists and teachers, but also work with the faculty of these amazing organizations to teach master classes or uh, give speeches or, you know, the, the partnership with has no limit, so it's, it's wonderful to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, it's a for CIM and Cleve uh, and Curtis Institute. Um, it's a chamber music focused um, summer program, so we accept string quartets. Mm -hmm. So the number of admission goes by string quartet. Um, and for the Juilliard program, is a little shorter. It's le a little less than two weeks, um, but it has a more a string orchestra focus. So we added double bass to that program as well. Um, and they have at least six lessons during the two weeks, uh, private lessons with different teachers, uh, chamber music coachings. They have two final performances at the end for chamber music and solo repertoire. They get to play master classes to renowned artists and the three organizations. Um, and the, the families get to come in and hear them play on, on the stages of Juilliard and Cleveland and Curtis. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. So the, these young people get to walk the hallowed halls <laughs> of the, the country's elite music institutions for two weeks over the yes. summer. That, yeah, that's incredible. And to, for them to be there, it, there's, there's got to be a, a psychological aspect of I can belong here. This this is the top and I can belong here. Yes, and one of the wonderful things that happen is that afterwards, uh, the connections that they make with the institutions and the work that happens after that. So as an example, Curtis, they want to keep connected with the students so they come back and apply for college there. So they keep uh, mentoring the students. Um, way past uh, spies over. Um, so they, they keep in contact and they keep sending materials. So hopefully um, the, the student body at Curtis will be more diversified when they accept the, the yeah. performance academy students back into the college level. That's wonderful. Absolutely. That's really, really cool. I, 
I, I absolutely love that. And I hope that that just keeps expanding and, and just more and more people partner and more. Um, I just see so much room for growth, which is so exciting that you all have developed programs that obviously are, are their trajectory is growing and there is room for that, which I think is really cool. And there's not really an end point. It just gets bigger and bigger, which is really, really exciting to me. Um, I just know. I have a yeah, quick yeah. question just to, to follow up here. So obviously the Sphinx Overture program, this is right now a Detroit and Flint focused program geographically. The Performance Academy, how many states mm -hmm. do you get applicants yeah. from for the Performance Academy? Oh, I should have gathered that information for you. For you. I can give you the final numbers um, later, but uh, many, many different states. Yeah. And in fact, from past years, there was some issue with scheduling, especially last year, because it was all virtual with the different time zones, because mm -hmm. you get kids from, all the way from the West Coast to the East Coast. So yeah, it's all over the country. Wow. And with the, is it still, ju it's just, it's just strings, right? It's all, these are yes. just string players. Okay. Um, which is, I think, I think that um, I, it's so cool. Cause I, I mean, well, I think getting into this a little bit, but like in, our area in Canton, and I think all over the country, strings programs are dwindling in the public schools. So it's really wonderful to have something that is string focused <laughs> because it's hard to find places that want to focus on the string players at the public education level. We here in Canton, uh, we, literally, we can look out the window of our studio here and see Hall of Fame Stadium by the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And so Canton is a football town and and at the high school level, football means marching band, yes. not orchestra. So Which we have wonderful winds, brass, yeah. and percussion Amazing. in our youth symphony programs. And the string players that we do get are wonderful. We just don't get Enough particularly of many of them. So this is an, a, an ad really quick. If you are a string player in the Canton area, please join the Canton Youth Symphony. No, but... Um, kind, you know, going back to this idea of education, and you've talked about this quite a bit, but this year and you came into the program during this year, has been challenging to say the least for education. And you know, here at Canton, all of my educational projects have been virtual. Um, our youth symphony has been virtual. Every, you know, it's, it's all just had to be um, as, as you do in a global pandemic. So you've talked a little bit about how that has looked. And so I, I guess my question for you is this idea of, of virtual education, blended education, some virtual, some not. How do you think that this year is going to affect students beyond just this year with this year of just weird education? How do you think it's going to affect the students? I will have to quote Michelle Obama again um, <laughs> from the documentary Becoming because somebody, a student asked her how was to get back on track to her normal life before and after the eight year presidency. And she said, there is not going back to, to the track. It's a whole new track, it's mm -hmm. a whole new way. And I, I think that will be true to the music world as well. There is no going back to the same track. Um, we had to invest a lot in technology and we had to learn, and we are still learning all about technology and teaching virtually and and how to use recordings in, as an advantage for your teaching. So that can still remain as part of our education. And I feel that the excitement of going back in person will create even more um, desire to learn and keep growing. But also we can use the technology to support that, more social media posts, more recordings to not only share with the world, but also as a tool for learning. Um, so all these lessons we've learned this year can can remain as part of our new normal. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wonderful. I, I Pandemic is horrible and all of that, but the resilience and, ever, and the lessons we learn can remain forever. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has been, the impact has been great. We are operating at a less than 20% capacity. So we have instruments in storage that could have been used all this these months and uh, you know that breaks my heart that we are not accessing as many kids as we could um but we also understand that this will, will be over soon hopefully and then we can go back with more enthusiasm and sharing even more and um just 
you know, enjoying the, the privilege that we have to share music education with all these kids. Um, so I'm, I'm truly hopeful to the new normal and using all that we learned towards yeah. even more music education. I was I was in a, a lead teacher meeting at, here in Stark County, and uh, we were talking about you know what have we learned from this pandemic, and what what are we what are the things that you we want to take from it? And almost all of us said recordings, the value of recordings and educational purposes, so students can listen to themselves, learn how to be independent players, and then bring that to an ensemble. All teachers said that is valuable and we need to keep this around because for, I think for music teachers, it's been very difficult, but Matthew and I have said this a lot. We've watched our youth symphony students grow way i don't just so much because there has been more personalized stuff because we can't do group things there's no way to do group stuff so it's all been one-on-one -on -one. and so we've actually been able to see a growth and so it's, i love what you said of we go back there's this enthusiasm we're back in person but what do we take what do we learn from this pandemic and keep it so that we can keep all the good stuff that we did learn from this pandemic i think that's valuable yeah, and just adding a little bit more towards the specialized education to the students who want to become professional musicians, especially I'm thinking about the Sphinx Performance Academy students. All this knowledge that came with online auditions, all the, the investment on microphones and the way you to record and what to do, th those are valuable lessons that actually, in my opinion, were kind of delayed in the education and up until the pandemic. Um, musicians would get into the studio to record and they had no idea how to behave inside the studio. So now everybody's used to use a microphone and, you know, it, the life of a professional musician in studios and recordings now will feel more familiar than you had in the past. So the technology revolution had to be happening way earlier and it had to be rushed now through a pandemic because mm -hmm. of this, the, the circumstances. But um, yeah, as I think it is, it is here to stay. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that as well, this pandemic has given opportunity for more access for students to audition for colleges. Instead of having to buy the plane ticket and spend yeah. thousands of dollars to try to audition for a school, there are ways to make it easier and more financially capable for students to get into these universities. And, you know, I remember when I was auditioning, I had to do pre-recorded auditions for several, pre-screening, and I was like, okay, I guess I set up a video camera and I play in front of, you know, it was, I'd never done it before. So I really am liking the fact that hopefully universities for students who have financial issues will keep some virtual aspects of auditioning so that students have the means to do so and don't feel like they don't, they can't do it because it's a plane right away. And the mentors of these students, the teachers at school, the private teachers, now we'll be able to help them to perfect their recorded audition in a way that certainly would not have been the case before. Mm. If we've all been forced to <laughs> to figure this out, but we're I mean, thankfully the world is going to open up sometime in 2021. We're going to have in-person concerts again, all of that great stuff, but we are going to take the knowledge that we've learned from this time and there will still be applications of it for the rest of our careers. No, absolutely. So this year, this past year has been so difficult in, in so many ways, but there have been so many responses from the classical music community, the, the world at large, the arts world at large, but including the classical music community to the murder of George Floyd last May. And of course, Sphinx has been at the forefront of this type of effort that we're seeing now since 1997, and now everyone else is sort of waking up to it. What do you think? What are some of your thoughts and the thoughts from the Sphinx organization of 2020 and why it caused so many organizations to finally think about all of this equity, diversity, and inclusion? On one side, it's exciting to see the amount of job openings on the area, orchestras and universities hiring um, DEI managers and directors. So it gives us hope that, you know, improvement is near, that, you know, that we are going to see a lot of improvements from here on. And 
it's tragic that Floyd had to die that way. But again, I'll have to quote Michelle Obama. Um, another impactful phrase that she said in the documentary is, we have to listen to each other's stories so we don't have to hear I can't breathe ever again. So if we hear each other's stories, as she says in the documentary, we break barriers. So when Floyd would say I can't breathe, policemen would listen. Or when a kid is in need of something, we will listen. Or, you know, the community is saying something, we will listen and then take action. So I think it all goes to listen, listen to each other, be open to share stories, and that will break barriers. Um, so it is a tragic thing that happened, but from there we can learn and change. So with all the new hirings that are happening, with the new leaders that I, are being trained now, I'm hopeful that the future will be prettier than what it is today. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you see this increased awareness and response? Do you see this as something that's going to have a lasting, that's, that's going to have staying power for the next several generations of orchestra musicians and patrons and organizations? Or are you worried maybe on the other hand, that it could potentially be a response for the times, but that it once everything sort of dies down, won't necessarily have the lasting change that we want it to have. It all depends on the work that we do now and how much we invest ourselves in the work. Um, you know, I lived my whole life inspired by other people. So <clears throat> at the project back in Brazil, I had my mentors there. Then at University of Southern Miss, I had Jay Dean as my mentor. I had, I had other mentors in University of Georgia, Heifetz Institute, and now I have a lot of mentors here at Sphinx. And I hope to be a mentor to young um, musicians as well, so they can have the same path that I had, just to look up and keep going. Um, because to many, many people out there, looking back or looking down, is, it will take you in a mental collapse. So you have to look up and forward. And if we keep doing the work and showing and leading by example, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. So with the hiring that is happening, as I mentioned, with the leaders that we're uh, creating today and training with Sphinx Connect in the following years, with the work that you're doing at Canton Symphony and with music education across the board, I don't think that will go away. And it can get, lower attention, perhaps not as many articles or as many publications, but if we focus on the groundwork, that is impactful enough to keep this going. Yeah. yeah. And what do you think that orchestras, other arts organizations, programs can learn from Sphinx? As you said, we've been doing this work for 24 years. What can we learn from you all as we start to embark finally on some of this work that we should have been doing 24 years ago? Sure, I would, I would suggest going to our website and there's a section called Call for Action. Mm. And in there you can find ideas and actions to take as an individual, as an educational institution, or you know, even higher levels, um, presenters and educators and so on. So there, if you go to our website and under resources, you're gonna find a lot of ideas and actions that you can take as an individual, as a musician, as a, an ed educator, as an institution. And we continue learning. The Sphinx organization is on the path of helping and, and addressing the underrepresentation issue. Um, but we are still on learning on the learning curve and that will, will last a long time because the world evolves and we keep sharing the, the lessons that we are learning. Um, and so we are happy to share the, the call for action um, to give you the start of what you can do in your community. Yeah, absolutely. So looking forward to the future 25 years into the future let's say what do you hope to see where do you hope to see the world of classical music as affected by all of the efforts that we are seeing right now through sphinx and through what the rest of the classical music field is doing if you could look forward 25 years into the future what do you hope to see as the result of the efforts right now 
that if you want to be a musician, you can. It's not that it's not for you. Like it, it's sad to see some kids look at an orchestra and say, this is not for me, I'll never be there. So I, I want to get in a time that the Sphinx organization is obsolete. We don't need any more of Sphinx organization because everybody's represented. Everybody feels that if you do want to follow that path, you have absolutely a way to get there. Um, and it goes for music or anything else in life. I just want to get to a time in, in, in the world that we can all dream and achieve our dreams regardless of background. Mm -hmm. I, I love, and I think that we've said, we've said that on the podcast, the goal of this podcast is that we don't need the podcast, right? The, the goal is that it doesn't, we don't need this anymore. And, you know, one thing about this podcast, it's called orchestrating change and that is our goal. And so we like to ask every guest, how do we, how do we orchestrate change? And you've given us a lot of really great concrete things, but are there any final words you would have to this question to our audience moving forward? I think it can get e easier misinterpreted or you can make it harder than it really is. So just make it simple and listen. Listening is the key. If you listen to the needs of a kid or to the needs of your community, then you can act on the needs of that specific place. As I mentioned, it's wonderful to see all the scholarly articles and, and the attention, but the one lesson that we can all take is to make it simple and listen to each other. That will create the change that we need. Absolutely. Before we let you go, just tell us what, what is the Sphinx organization's website so our listeners can learn more or donate or just explore a little bit more of the work that the Sphinx organization does? Sure. Our website is sphinxmusic.org. Um, and there you can find uh, links to sign up for our newsletter, information on all the portfolios that we have, uh, news and the, the calendar with all the events that we're hosting. Wonderful. And finally, you mentioned, of course, that the Performance Academy does two weeks at Cleveland Institute of Music, which is in our listening area. It's only about an hour from here in Canton. So some of our listeners in the area may be interested in checking out some of the performances of the Performance Academy this summer. What weeks will the Sphinx Performance Academy be at CIM? It starts on July 10 and it goes for two weeks. Uh, we continue to monitor the situation so we are not um, fully decided if it will be in person or not. Mm -hmm. So the best way is to follow our website with any news that will come in the next couple of weeks is the decisions that we'll make. Um, but if it is in person, as we're hoping, um, the concerts uh, will be advertised in our uh, Sphinx Performance Academy page. Um, and so if you go to sphinxmusic.org, you can find the programs and Sphinx Performance Academy will, will be there. Absolutely. Dr. Anna Abrantes, it was an honor to speak with you today. Truly, thank you so, so much for your yes. time and for sharing everything you've shared with us this afternoon. It's been a delight to be part of this. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Dr. Anna Abrantes, Director of Education at the Sphinx Organization. Orchestrating Change is a production of the Canton Symphony Orchestra. Our theme music was composed by Eric Gould and performed by Derek Snyder and Tim Adams. Our audio engineer is Nathan Maslick. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.